Hey girls, it's your girl Nye here and I'm back but finally on a Thursday. I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, like, comment, and subscribe and don't forget to share this video. If you didn't like this video, just like. I will still love you anyway. But please be warned, viewers discretion is advised. Okay, let's get into the story. On September 12, 1982, two off-duty Alaska police officers were out hunting in a very remote section of Alaska, 20 minutes away from Anchorage. Anchorage is a city in Alaska. The, the only way you could... Re oh, my God, what the fuck? Here I go. I'm telling y'all. Anyway, the only way you can get into this section is by plane or boat. So the only people that go here are big time hunters. After a long day, it's about to get dark, so the two men realize it's time to turn around and let's head back to camp. Like, we gotta go to sleep. It's scary out here. And start heading back to camp. The journey to the woods was kind of rough, so they walked down to the nearby Canic River. I don't know what that is. I should have researched it. But yeah, they walk down to their nearby Canic River and walk across this exposed sand bar. As they are walking, they notice a boot ahead sticking out. As they are walking closer, they realize it's not just a freaking boot. It's a freaking boot with a fucking leg sticking out of it. A human leg. So being cop, they knew not to touch anything, you know, so they won't ruin the crime scene. They mark their, uh, where they are on that map and they get the fuck up out of there, girl. They reported it back to the department, and on the next day, a crime scene investigator was on the scene. They found out that the remains still had women clothing on them. They were still out searching for evidence, as they also found a single two twenty three caliber round. This was common for a hunting rifle. They did an autopsy, and the victim was a female. She has been dead for at least six months. And this was definitely a homicide. She had three bullet wounds in her but there wasn't any bully wounds in her clothing. So with that being said, that means she didn't have any clothes on at the time she was killed. That means the killer got her redressed. That's so creepy, what the fuck? They also found a hospital being wrapped up inside her clothing that was used to blindfold her. A couple of weeks after the autopsy, the dental records came back to identify 23-year-old Sherry Morrow. Like bone marrow, yeah. She was a dancer from Anchorage who was reported missing 10 months earlier. In her report, it was said that she told her friends she was offered $300 to have pictures taken of her. Back then, that was a serious scam that got a lot of women and teens killed. They'll tell you they're a professional photographer and you're so pretty they would love for you to model for them and boom, you will never see them again. Sherry was supposed to meet this man and then boom, they never seen Char... Uh, why are you getting this girl name wrong? They never seen Sherry again. Police believe that the murderer was, in fact, the photographer. Oh, see? Photographer. There you go. But the police didn't have any evidence to pursue this person. The only thing that they had was this single shell casing. But it's a lot of hunters in Alaska. That's how they eat out there, girl. It is cold. They have to go out and get their food. The police report the findings to the media in hopes that someone will reach out with more information. During one of the press conferences, one of the reporters asked, do you think Sherry's death is connected to the other unsolved deaths in the, part of, the other part of Alaska? Because, girl, this is not the first time. Two years earlier, two other women's bodies were found in that area where Sherry remains were found. One of the women was decomposed so badly that there was no way to identify her. But it was revealed that she was probably in her late teens or 20s. The other lady was identified as 24-year-old Joanne Messina, who was a dancer from Anchorage. But there wasn't any evidence found with these discoveries. So their deaths remained cold. But at the press conference, the police told the reporters that Sherry's death wasn't connected, but the low key, they knew it was connected. Mm -hmm. But the three women, they died at the same grave site, and also the other two was dancers. Come on, it's, co it's a connection. Also, there was a rise in missing young dancers and sex workers in Anchorage. Over the past couple of years, this convinced officers that they were definitely dealing with a serial killer. But they couldn't publicly, an publicly announce it because they didn't have any proof. So the girls' cases just sat there and grew cold. Also, no one claimed them or had any information on these girls. 
But more and more dancers and sex workers went were going missing in Anchorage, Alaska. On June 13, 1983, the police finally got a break. That morning, a man is on the road driving his truck on this highway in Anchorage. He sees this girl running towards him, running him running towards him with handcuffs on and she's naked like it's cold as fuck in alaska like all the time and this girl is naked haul ass and down the street she jumps in his truck without any hesitation she ducks down so nobody could see her the man is looking around but he didn't see anything and he wasn't about to wait to find out what the poor child was running from i don't blame him he, she was so scared. She didn't talk. She didn't say nothing. He was not bothered. He didn't want to, you know, bother her and upset her. So he just took her wherever she needed to be to be safe. So she's like, take me to my motel. He do as she says. She runs inside the motel terrified. The front desk clerk sees this young girl naked and shaking with a handcuff. So she immediately calls the police. The police come and the girl let them in. She said her name is Sydney Paulson and she is 17 years old. The police then asked her what happened to her. The police said her story was horrible, but she was so brave at telling her story. This is her story. The night before, Sis is working her night shift in Anchorage. This car pulled up with this wiry, bearded man with glasses on. He didn't look like a, dre a threat. Looks can be very deceiving. He asked to buy her services. So she got in the passenger seat. He immediately threw on his handcuff and these handcuffs on her. And she like he told sis to be quiet. She like, you know what I mean? He drives her to this neighborhood, pulled in this driveway, got her out the car, led her into this basement, and put her on chains and assaulted her for hours. Basically until he got tired. After he got done, he told her he was about to go take a nap. The nerve of him. When he came back, they were going to leave this house and go to his cabin in the woods. Sis is terrified, begging for her life. He's just ignoring her. He then tells her if you scream or make any noise, he was going to kill her. Several hours go by and she is just hanging from the wall, just half naked, thinking about what the fuck he's about to do to her. He then wakes up, unchains her. Bring her upstairs to his living room and is just showing off all his hunting trophies and telling her how he loves hunting and where he goes to hunt. And Sydney is realizing like she's just a liability. Like he's showing her her face, he like places he like to go, things he like to do. And she's like, he's going to kill me, period. So she is like, I have to escape. After the tour, he puts her in the car and drives to his airplane hangar. He puts her on the plane, starts loading gun by gun and shit that looked like military supplies into the plane. Sis is so fucking scared and she like, this is my fucking chance. When this plane takes off, I'm dead. The man went over to his car. Sydney jumps out the plane, falls on the ground, gets up and starts haul assing out the hangar. She then turns into the forest all the way to the highway when she's seen the guy and he brings her to the motel. But the cops is just astonished because they believed this. She was shaken. She was so detailed. So they didn't have no choice to believe her. The cops took her to the hospital, but she tells them, well, she's, they're going to take her. And she's telling them, wait, before y'all take me, can y'all take me to the airport so I can identify the hangar and hopefully the plane is still there. When they arrive, she is able to identify the hangar and they, at their surprise, the plane is still there. The police get out. They start taking notes. The security guard, the security guards who work at the airport, sees the police and they're like, "Yo, the night before, the owner of this plane, he was acting suspicious," and he recorded the man's license plate. He gives it to the police and they are like, they are able to locate the man. His name is Robert Henson, who owned a successful bakery downtown. The police realized Robert's car matched the description of what Sydney described. After dropping Sydney off to the hospital, the police want to pay Robert a visit. Hello, Robert. It's me. <laughs> Robert invites the police inside the house that also matches the description of what Cindy was uh, saying when she was there. The police asked him what he was doing the night before. She's, he said he was with his friends. The police checked the property, but it doesn't look like it was any struggling, struggle that happened there. So the police called Robert's friends to confirm his alibi, and his friends tell the police, like, yes, we was all together the night before. So the police go back to the hospital, like, Sydney, are you sure this happened to you? 
um, would you like to take a lie detector test? And she is like, no. We don't know why. Maybe she just simply didn't trust the police and what they might ask her. So when Sydney realized the police don't really believe her anymore, she gets up and just disappears, which leaves her case cold and Robert still free. Until three months on September 2nd, on this day, a group of construction workers was work doing some work on the back of that same road when one of the machines revealed some more human remains. The police were caught and they were gathered. They, the rest of the remains, and just like Sherry's investigation, they found a single shell case and belonging to a, 222, a 223 caliber round. The remains was brought back from the autopsy where they confirmed the victim was a woman who died from multiple gunshot wounds. Using dental records, they are able to confirm the victim is 17-year-old Paula Golden, who was also an exotic dancer, who went missing five months prior. From Ingrid's, the police sent the 223 shell casings in to see if they matched the other uh, 223 casings that was found. And yes, all the shell casings was shot from the same rifle. At this moment, the police knew that they were dealing with a serial killer. Many police officers believed that Robert Hansen was definitely the guy be behind these crimes. But he had an alibi and they had no evidence against him. The police then reached out to a well-known FBI <clears throat> excuse me, profile, John Douglas. And they asked him to build a profile on who he thinks committed these murders. When the profile comes back describing a man in his 40s, well-known and liked by society, blended in very well, he's successful, a normal guy. He owned his own business. He was also at the outdoors men. He was a hunter. He had a bad speech problem also. Uh, dude couldn't talk. John John is describing Robert Hansen. So going off John's success rate of profiling, a judge sees this and gives the FBI a search warrant to search Robert's house. And at this time, they find everything, girl. They find a hunting map of the area with 37 X marks on it where some of the other girls was found at. They also found the 223 caliber rifle, a bag full of women's jewelry that contained a necklace belonging to Sherry Morrow. As the FBI is carrying out all the evidence out the house, a neighbor walks to them and say, hold on. It's just with thirsty. It says, my husband recently lied about covering for Robert. Also, he had no idea about how serious the situation was. You know, she was basically like, we don't have shit to do with this. I'm like, y'all know now. LOL. <laughs> yeah, I can't. Anyway, so they find Robert and tell him, we know what you did last summer. Okay, I'm done with the jokes. Okay. They said, we all have this evidence. Like, you're done. And he's like, I'll confess, but only for f the four murders that they already knew about. So the police wanted to locate the rest of the victims. So, you know, they like, okay, we'll arrest you for the four murders, but we want you to tell us everything and you won't be prosecuted for the other murders. He signs the deal and reveals a horrific confession. He said, and I quote, I would drive around Anchorage at night and look for young, vulnerable women and who were alone they were usually sex workers and exotic dancers who i would um who the, i would and quote robert uh tone a friend at clubs i would tell them i'm a photographer you're beautiful i want to ph photograph you i will pay you for the session and most of the girls are thinking like this is their ticket out i'm about to become a model so robert would say let's meet up here particularly at a fast food restaurant he would show up early and hide in his car to see if the girls are alone or not. And when he sh when, when he saw that they were alone, he would drive up. But what they didn't know, that there was a handcuff on the passenger door. So he would pretend he was helping them put on their seatbelt. And he would grab their arm, put it in the handcuff, draw his pistol, and tell them to shut the fuck up at this point. He's bragging, girl. Like, he's bragging to the police. Like, yeah, I'm really good at this fucking loser. He would bring the victim to the basement, assault them until he gets tired. He would take them to the airport, but unlike Cindy, these girls didn't survive. He would fly them to his cabinet, not far from where the victims were found, undress them, blindfold them, assist them out the door, and tell them to run. 
Girl, they are believing if they get far enough, they will be free. But what they didn't know is this area is secluded and surrounded by deep ass water. So he will hunt them for hours, sometimes days. Sometimes he would sneak up on them and just stab them so he could have a blood trail to follow. Like he was having fun. Girl, he is sick. He told authorities at some point they would give up and he would just finish them. Then remove their handcuffs, redress them. Before Robert is sent off to serve his life sentence without parole, they had him help search for the rest of the victims. But unfortunately, they were only able to locate eight more because the others were finished off by animals or he didn't remember or he just ain't want us to know, girl. And in 2014, Robert died leaving us stumped on how many actual victims he actually murdered. So, thank you for today's video, guys. I'm happy I finally got it out. If you like today's makeup look, you can check out my TikTok. I'll link everything down in the description box. And I love y'all. See you in a Monday. Bye.